um, with, you know, I mean, obviously prompted a lot by TikTok, but um, with reels and, and all that um, and where that's going to settle and whether, you know, at some point in the future, <laughs> yeah, where or in the future, this, could be, this could be very dramatic or upside down. I mean, I, I imagine we'll still have problems. Wow. Yeah. Somehow I, yeah, I, that you've just come up with the only solution, the, the only eventuality that I think is, I can guarantee is not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, with the, you know, thinking about the, the increasing, I don't, I don't think you're, we're ever going to end up with TVs that are hanging on our, our walls that are portrait format as opposed to landscape. But, um, but I do imagine that we're going to have to be accommodating it more. And there's, there, there was one series like about, um, like two years ago, um, I mean, I watched an episode or two of it and I, I can't remember what it was called, but, um, I think Julia Roberts was in it where they shot it square format. You know, it was it was on a streaming service? It was on you know Netflix or Hulu or something like that. But um, it was an interesting thing. It was a, a a too early venture into like we know that a lot of people are going to be watching this on phones. Let's make it you know or or Instagram, I guess. I mean, square format almost seems like the worst of both worlds because you don't get any expansiveness in any direction, but. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, the aspect ratio wars that aren't even wars, but where's that going? Um, apparently part of it, I think it's homecoming and, um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. part That's of the it. rationale, it, it shows two different time periods and one time period is four by three and the other mm. one is 16 by nine. Okay. All right. <clears throat> There's, um, uh, Google did a tablet a couple of years ago that had like a four by five format, some really kind of odd format. And I don't mm. know, the tablets haven't done that well, but I thought it was kind of interesting they were doing that. Um, April's hitting a little bit of a problem with portrait or landscape because um, we're doing some B-roll and stuff like that for, she's doing a, a show reel, basically a, a speaking reel. And I, we, we, you know, we, I, I actually followed her. I dropped her off at the at PDX, but then I followed her and sort of, you know, was the guy filming somebody bopping through an airport kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then we had, we had to go back and film it in, in, in landscape because we the first time we did it was, was portrait. And they, they were like, no, we actually need the landscape for this other. I'm like, ah, okay. Um, and then whenever I watch, so all the YouTube shorts are short and very awkward on screen because I can't make them big. And then when you see landscape shot on regular YouTube, they fuzz it, they, they blow it up yeah, and fuzz yeah. it on the sides, which is like yeah. a weird viewing experience. So I'm, I'm unsatisfied as well. Is this something we, that is going to disturb us for the rest of our known lives? Um, all video will end up being 360 video um, and you'll we'll have- Look around. You'll have uh, people that come along and and curate the, the aspect ratio and the and the shot and the framing and all that kind of stuff. It does that mean, particular <clears throat> does that mean we'll be wearing ones. goggles? Mm, probably not. Probably have retinal implants. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> that's the worst of all possible. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I agree. Man. <laughs> I just, I just sent you reeling, Pete. I just feel you kind of <laughs> <laughs> contemplating that. Um, on that page about homecoming, there's one cool GIF um, where I it, it doesn't sound like the whole thing worked um, for the whole series, but there was one point where they got to go from four three to sixteen nine. And, you know, Julia Roberts' world changed, you know, and you, mm. it was like a, a visceral thing um, for the viewers. Hmm. So interesting. So what kind of fellowship of the linky things are on your minds today? 
Um, I'm still thinking about um, Fancy and, and me talking and whoever else talking about uh, Git. And actually, I'm also giving the Git plus Markdown or Markdown plus Git uh, class. We had our first session last Thursday. We're having another session this Thursday, tomorrow. Excuse me. Cool. And I'm hoping Fonsian makes it here, but it doesn't look like it so far as so. I um, I am uh, thinking practical thoughts about some work I'm doing with um, the CTA and adjacent entities and ESC uh, about um, uh, you know pulling together links related to ethical tech, reading, watching, listening, um, you know things you should know, people you should follow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, um, as always, you know, struck by like the forms that that each of us have, the material we could contribute to such an effort, you know, that's in your brain, that's in my, you know, factor streams, that's in somebody else's bookmark list, that's in your, you know, massive Wikipedia, you know, what, whatever, <clears throat> and and uh, even for a a kind of finite product like that, um, whether whether these things can be, I mean, they're all links in this case, so you know, it's it's probably fairly easy to off dump them. Um, is that? Sorry, I just I just saw that Jonathan Rosen thing. Oh, that's a different Jonathan Rosen. Okay. Um, there's no illustrative aspect to this, is there? It's it's prose. Uh, the link I just popped in. Yeah, it's got a nice picture of the of the Talmud, um, which as, is which is hyper, one of the most hypertext. which is one of the most photogenic of hypertexts. Yep, and which is remarkable given how old it is. I you know when one of the one of the immediate reactions you have to that is like, huh. They invented that long, long, long before Doug Engelbart and, and uh, Ted Nelson and um, uh, you know all that all that kind of jazz. And then I'm like, you know, it's a survivorship bias thing. You know, it's like people tried to do this lots of different ways, um, and all the other ones got forgotten. And this is the one that you know is kind of useful and practical and works. And that's because it had a community of practice that insisted on doing that and reinforced it over time. And, and dramatically. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Or, it, you know, uh, minimally sufficient, sufficiently usable. And, you know, actually, I guess the, so it, it, it had time to gestate for probably centuries at least. It must have been um, fun in the era of scribes because normally scribes were doing linear text without p punctuation yeah. or spaces often before yeah. we figured that stuff out. And then with the, the occasional illustration or embellishment, and then all of a sudden you get like a hypertext before you have uh, printmaking and you've got to replicate that hypertext and you've got to do it faithfully mm. over and over. Uh, maybe not replicate. You have to represent it. So that's probably part of the fun, right? Yeah, but I think that the the margin for changing anything was really, really low. Yeah. Like the yeah. punishment for errors was probably pretty high. Yeah. Um. So you, I, it would be really fun if you could riff. That that'd be really awesome. Uh, but I'm not sure those communities had room for that much riffing. So if the Talmud goes that far back, why aren't we speaking in hypertexts now easily other than Wikipedia, which is kind of the, the thing that ate that world? Why, why is this not more yeah. common? E even Wikipedia, I think most people don't consume it in hypertext. They think they of it as a, an encyclopedia an with pages. Yeah. 
that, oh, look, there's a link here, and then they might follow the link, but they're not, they're not conceiving of it as a woven work, yeah. probably. I, I agree, unfortunately. I, uh, I, I have a hypothesis, and it goes along with the hypothesis I, I shared with a friend yesterday. Um, uh, he was talking about the challenges of uh, visual, uh, um, communicating ideas uh, visually mm -hmm. um, uh, and with things like diagrams and diagrams and you know and quick drawings and stuff like that. So we we actually started with Mid Journey. I'm like, yeah, Mid Journey doesn't do that. ChatGPT does that a little bit. Um, so we played around a little bit with ChatGPT, um, and some. And actually, I was trying to get it to describe uh, an infographic, um, and instead it made a matplotlib <laughs> source code thing hmm. that drew it instead. But anyway, um, the 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 big thing I wanted to say here was uh, kind of a lamentation about um, our visual literacy um, as a culture um we get taught how to read linear text um, as a culture we do not get taught how to read visual diagrams or maps or things like that um, and and we don't get taught how to represent those things you know much um all the you know anything that has to do with drawing is like okay well that's the art department i don't know why you're doing that in this class um so it's like we've lopped off uh all the um, all the tutelage and, and thinking and, and creativity around visual representation because we don't do that here. You know, we don't do that in pedagogy. Totally agree. And uh, the alphabet versus the goddess had one particular mm -hmm. thesis about that, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which I liked. Yeah. That book influenced me a bunch. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good connection. in my brain and in my notes for this call. Um, you're about to say something? This is a cool image search. Um, Talmud before printing oh, uh, cool. images. Um, and mostly it's not before printing, I think, but you still get cool things. Yeah, these all look like uh, printing books, but it's very cool stuff. Wow, wraparounds. Yeah, this this is interesting. I didn't know about this before. Medieval commentaries on the Talmud in the outer margin and opposite Rashi's notes. Mm -hmm. How would you like to have Tosafist on your resume? <laughs> uh, I would be pretty proud to have that, I think. Mm -hmm. It would be a small group of people who would know what that meant. Yep. I really, looking at this, I'm, I'm, I'm fasc fascinated by the, um, the text blocks. I'm just looking at the, you know, scrolling through the, um, image search and particularly that very well a lot of them have these sort of wraparound text blocks which is something that didn't exist with a whole lot without a whole lot of trouble certainly didn't exist on old hand typesetting could exist with a lot of trouble in machine setting of the 20th century and exploded with desktop publishing because suddenly you could you could do things like that um, but the fact that it pre-existed desktop desktop publishing in a significant way is news to me and 
it makes me really wonder if things like what I don't see here is a curved margin um, or gutter, um, but you certainly could have done that. And I wonder if it was done by anyone. It'd be interesting to, to like right before printing and right after printing to see kind of how the that not got negotiated um, for the Talmud and for uh, illustrated manuscripts. Um, also, I'm wondering how much scribing was part of memorizing. Yeah. Um, meaning, and I think in madrasas. Um, a part of the memorization of the Quran involves transcribing it, writing it, but I'm not sure. Um, but I think you learn you learn to write Arabic and then you learn to repeat the, repeat the, the Quran. Um, and I'm thinking that in Judaism, there was very likely a similar sort of thing, but I don't know the correlation between Tosafists and scribes or whatever. I don't, I don't know if that's a one-to-one -one thing where, where, if, where you sort of went through a scribal tutorial stage in order to memorize and become a, a rabbi or a scholar? I don't know. That'd be interesting to know. One thing I would guess, sorry, this is not related to, uh, Jerry, to what you were just saying, but um, but more to that, the, what, Pete, what you were just saying in response to me, that in that transition from, uh, you know, to printing, I would imagine having just observed the transition from printing to digital, um, that there was that the that the early attempts were so crude that you would never think to try and duplicate what was going on scribally, you know, just because it's just the same way that like yeah. an early word processing document and uh, and you know early websites and stuff had no no means for graphic sophistication of any kind you know it, and it was probably a couple of decades which might have been even longer with the printing press before you know people developed um, the abilities to do something that would be anywhere near. I, you know, the, I, know. I, I guess, so, so there must have been woodcut printing that replicated like fancy manuscripts. Like that's that true. Of, that's true. Um, and then, and then it was actually movable type that, that gave you the strictures, right? Right. So, I, I, I mean, wonder, there, there were probably there were probably combinations of the two pretty early yeah. on. And yeah. I mean, I know there were, I know that yeah. you had, you know, woodcuts as illustrations for yeah. um, type documents. Mm -hmm. But I mean, getting to the point where anything could wrap around anything else, probably even, well, I mean, laborious column justification happened pretty, pretty early. <laughs> Yeah, that's Once insane. That actually. But also, before we had pages in folios, we had scrolls and irregularly shaped uh, parchments true. and other sorts of things. So we, we, we it was more freeform for a while, or at least like more like a comic strip than a, than a book. More like a vertical. No, I mean it was a horizontal scroll. But um, I think most some, well, some, some, scrolls, some scrolls ran wide. And, and here we are circling back around to portrait versus landscape. We're right back there. It's astonishing. <laughs> I love that. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> that was good. See, and you're talking about wraparound. Yeah. Hmm. That's very cool how that worked. Wraparound, which is sort of picture in picture. Oh, but that's a different dimension now. No, I know. It's interesting how, like on the iPad and stuff like that, you can do a variety of 
pretty sophisticated, either split screen, picture in picture or whatever to try to manage real estate. I don't really know them or use them like, like, you know, copy and paste, no problem. They're buried somewhere in the limbic system. But then as you get finer grained, it's like <clears throat> features I don't, I don't avail myself of. So, and, and I can never make uh, in Mac OS, I can never make alternate desktops work. They just don't work in my head at all. Yeah, I've not tried much. I mean, I think I've done it occasionally. I tried to simplify my life that way during during the pandemic. I was like, okay, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do alternate desktops. And I was like, nope, not not sticking. I mean, I think there's there's a future there, and I think, I mean, this to me is interesting about the what what's envisioned by the um, the Apple. Well, in the demos for the Apple goggles is this sense of, you know, okay, enough with my gaming space. I'm switching to my workspace or I'm switching to my domestic space. I mean, I, I, I built, you know, building on the you know, to me, sort of the biggest virtue of of factor is the notion that you're creating spaces and streams and sharing around particular aspects of your life. And when you're not in that, and you're in something else, there's no, there's no peppering the feed that you're seeing with stuff that we know you'd be interested in, because it's related to this other part of your life, because you're you're only in that space mm -hmm. and the the desktops the alternate desktops if they get to the point where it seemed like apple was going in those demos where you really are saying okay now i'm in my space where i'm focused on this whether it's you know meditation or spreadsheets or like immersive gaming and and that's an easy swipe um that that does seem like a place you'd want to go um in the knowledge navigator demo one of the things i liked <clears throat> that would still make sense and it would fit what you just said is they had some avatars basically singing sitting in the margin and as you were doing things the different i hope this was the knowledge navigator demo but the avatars would basically kind of raise their hand if they had something to say to you in you know in the middle of what you were doing and they might represent different parts of your life or different research projects that you're on or something like that. And, and so they, they would try to catch your attention in some, in some way, and then you could diverge from whatever it is you're doing now and, and go pursue that. I mean, sort of a, a notification alert of a, of a kind, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, totally. Without, and, and you could, I mean, ideally with something like that, you could say, nope, don't want to see that. You know, I'm I'm totally immersed in my meditation or whatever, um, or more likely the immersive gaming, um, and and you know alerts can't show, but maybe when you're in your workspace, you do allow you know um, somebody to alert either with that little wave or with something more disruptive mm -hmm. and and the wave could translate into any other kind of attention getting mechanism yeah yeah it seems it seems weird to me that <sighs> we're still so backwards in how we communicate and how we co-create like when we, when we decide hey let's do something together it's like is it google docs or what and <laughs> and and then the what question is like this pandora's box still um, and that's, that's not, should not be that way. It should not. That's why we're here. That's right. Partly. Well. Um, yeah. Um, I think I brought it up at a fellowship of the link, um, meeting, but uh, have you guys checked out um, uh, a board? Um, Spell? A, a, B, uh, hold on. Just get to you. 
Uh, the bookmark sharing thing that Paul Ford created? Yep. Yep. It's in my brain, but I haven't really looked at it. I mean, the best thing about it is it's very, it's even, you know, less, less tech centric than anything that any of us have been involved with. Oh, right. It right. creates, it creates stacks, right? Yeah. Just little stacks of things. Stacks and, and cards. You know, fairly flexible. Mm -hmm. um, Good idea. Yep. I mean, it's kind of factor, but you know, but even it's it's the MVP that factor should have had before it got into you know RSS feeds and groups and stuff. I, I like a little frustrating because I yeah <laughs> went and talked to Paul <laughs> about early on about um, doing it with uh, with Postlight and. Um, you know, I mean, not that this isn't an obvious idea in other ways, but why not then? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I like the idea that, <clears throat> well, I guess, forgive forgive me for thinking this, but um, I, I think a factor is bookmarking important links I want to share and read again, kind of, like like uh, Delicious, mm -hmm. Dear Departed Delicious and Pimbor yeah. and stuff like that. Um, and their, you know, their front page, it's more like, yeah, you know, make a card out of any link, um, brown leather couch at Polly and Bark. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it's taking it much more like you're kind of what you were just saying and the analogs you were drawing with delicious and stuff like that is like, you're, you're thinking of the the end product of this, like you're going to have all this organized bookmark yeah. universe, um, which sounds both amazing if you're into it and daunting. And they're trying to make the speed bump, you know, to kind of eliminate that speed bump of thinking of the threatening eventuality and just say, Hey, there's this you want to put somewhere. Okay. Done. Yeah. You know. Yep. The problem, um, I, go ahead. I like extending from like also information, kind of text-based information to just like hmm, objects, things, whatever. Yeah. Part of the problem seems to be like, okay, you want to put something somewhere, the where do you put it bit. And part of the reason we like markdown files on a GitHub repo is that the where is at least in some public space that's findable and linkable and open to others. But in most of these cases, the where is somebody's proprietary whiteboard or, or chalkboard or whatever zoomable whiteboard metaphor that is not shared space in any particular yeah. way. And mostly not public, well, mostly it's a private whiteboard. Uh, in some cases, it's made public, but not very. I mean, the beauty of the, the card as a notion extending from the link as a notion, I mean, the, the link is a totally, you know, portable, a link can exist in your brain and, you know, on a board and all the places. And, um, and a card as a representation of a link or as a representation of anything seems like the kind of lingua franca that could extend all over the place. And, you know, that, that looks like one thing on X and another thing on Mastodon and another thing. And, 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 and it's almost true for that, you know, the, the degree to which it's an understood piece of formatting to say, this is how my link will populate, you know, this graphic, this headline, this description is, is what my link turns into. That's already understood, you know? Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, 
I'm thinking as I'm saying this, you know, Git is obviously not for everyone. Um, and, and the places that are for everyone, as you say, Jerry, are like the private spaces. Um, but there is already this sort of ease of like, if I share the link from my, that came to me via Twitter decks and I put it on Instagram or, you know, that it's going to populate okay in, in, in a legible form that is essentially a card. Um, yeah, sorry. I got that. That's as far as that thought goes for me, but it, seems like that's a place to concentrate. Mm -hmm. um, Christopher Allen was experimenting for a while with a form of writing that was more cartoon-like. I've forgotten what he called it, but following, following panels and ideas around. Uh, it was called Huh, I thought it was him, but I'm not finding it here. And then uh, Scott uh, McLeod in Understanding Comics yeah, and, other, and other things and other places, he was doing a whole lot of thinking about uh, the forms of rhetoric or forms of semiotics, or he wasn't using any of those words, but he was busy exploring the space of how we express ourselves. Uh, in part, Understanding Comics was exploring why, co why do comics work? Like when he when he describes how Tintin, one of my favorite cartoons, works, and he says the 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 background is realistic, but the faces are comic and pretty blank. Like Tintin's face doesn't change very much. It's it's almost like a smiley face. Uh, it's a little bit better than a smiley face, but the rest of it's drawn very lifelike. And I'm, I'm like, my head exploded because I how how do you do that? Because Charlie Brown is fully cartoon. And the same level of abstraction, the whole, the whole drawing. Um, but in Tintin, it's different, and it works, and it works partly because you can project yourself into it, and and our mind loves that. And that that was just really really interesting space for me because he then had the triangle, the very famous tri sort of triangle that included you know realistic, abstract, and, and I've forgotten what the other dimension was. And then he placed historic comics in that triangle according to where they fell. And it was really, really interesting. I wish when he sold the, the cells or the drawings, the originals, I had bought that one. Because at some point later on, he, he made a little bit of money by selling off the, the drawings. This is Scott McLeod. Scott McLeod one talking about. Uh, cool. Yeah, understanding comics. Are you guys, I, we, we've never particularly talked about comics. Are you, are you comic fans? Um, I, I'm, I'm somewhere in between, like I have zero collection of comic books. I, I bought some comic books when I was little, but never collected. So I don't, I don't have a, a collection, but I'm fascinated by different comics. There are a few that I, that I've cared about really deeply, like Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, my, my spirit animal is Spaceman Spiff, Conqueror of the Cosmos. Um, and my first handle online was Spiff at Panics. I'm pretty sure that was my first handle. Might have been Spiff it well. Might have been Spiff it well. Or both. Yeah. <laughs> Comics and the big triangle. And, and, yeah. and you, Pete? Uh, I, I'm actually a big cartoons person, like Warner Brothers cartoons. Um, mm -hmm. And then, I, although I have to say, part of that for me, it, it I didn't realize it until later, is part of it is the music, actually. Mm. Um, I forget the guy, um, but 
I, I, the, uh, the Chuck the Chuck Jones counterpart. The yeah. Chuck Jones was the visuals, and the somebody else who was the yeah. I mean, um, not that Chuck the, Jones was the only one, but yeah, you know, there is a guy. Um, Chuck Jones was actually not my favorite. There was one of the yeah. other people who was. <laughs> um, but um, I I had I finally you know they made a CD of of uh, Warner Brothers music and that just mm -hmm. entranced me. But um, I I'm not really a comics person, but I love visual representation. So that's mm -hmm. where you know it's like. Scott McCloud's book, it's like, a, you know, a Bible kind of to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's all about visual representation. It's party time for, for people curious about that. And, and it would be interesting to sort of spiral out from understanding comics and see what's come since. Because I don't, I don't, I'm kind of nosing around a little bit and I'm not, I'm not, not a lot has caught my attention sort of since then. There's an, another guy who cares about this stuff is Bruce Mao, <clears throat> but he's, he's more commercial artistic design or something like that. Yeah, and there's so much. Uh, have you looked? There's a there's a new anthology series. Um, I mean, this is you know animation, but but comic ish animation. Um, God, what is the name of it? It's a it's a sci-fi. Pretty sure it's on Netflix. I'll have to find it. Um, uh, that's got some just amazing illustration. Um, I mean, the, the the thing that you talk about about Tintin, and which is true of Van Dessine in general, you know, the sort of line drawing from a photograph. I mean, the sort of photorealistic background, and then the simplistic um, faces and sometimes figures um, has like gotten to the point where. Uh, there, there's this, uh, I'll have to find a link to it. There's this one thing that I saw um, where faces were line drawings, but obviously that sort of rotoscope like realism of, I mean, you know, like, um, you know, somebody had been filmed and, um, you know, lips were totally synced. Mm -hmm. um and and then but it was still line drawing and the backgrounds were like paintings i mean fantasy um so not the backgrounds paintings. have been replaced <clears throat> well the backgrounds i mean the backgrounds were were as much more realistic as you know as the band destiné tintin backgrounds were than the faces but but the line drawing of the faces was more realistic and the and the amazingly detailed rendering of the backgrounds was hyper realistic except that it was hyper realism about you know extra planetary locations and and non not yet existing technology and mm. stuff like that um i'll, I'll see if i can find it because it would it really my jaw dropped I really enjoyed um, watching the rotoscoped series um, on. What, I just put it there. How did I miss it? There we go. Undone. Yeah, it was really fun. It was really, really nice, and it's got Bob. What's his name? Who shows up freaking everywhere? <laughs> He's astonished. Yeah, what, Rosa, Odin Rosa, what's her name? Odin. Or, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Odin. As soon as she said Bob, who shows up everywhere, I thought Odin. That's amazing. Have you guys watched? Have you guys watched the bear? No. no. Oh man. It I'm is it oh it is it's <laughs> the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Bob really? Odenkirk shows up there slightly. I mean it, <laughs> I realize it's about, you know, food and restaurants ostensibly, right. but it's really about human dynamics and and team work and personality types and it, it's it's and and you know deep history versus modern gloss and and it, just all kinds of stuff race relations mm -hmm. age i think it's and, on and hulu or something strange it's on, like that it's on hulu and, and i don't i don't do hulu so I, that's what made well, me not watch it if they're 
I mean, it's worth doing Hulu for. <laughs> um, it, and the other great thing about it is the episodes, even though it's a drama, the episodes are only a half an hour for the most part. Hmm. So you can, you know. Um, on, but, on Hulu, you also get uh, Only Murders in the Building, which is fun. Which I have not well, yet well seen. Yet. It's, um, it's really well done. And it's it's not incredibly deep, but it's super fun. Uh, Steve Martin and... Um, yeah. Martin Short, and, and, and Martin Short and, and now uh, Meryl Streep and Paul Rudd, Selena Gomez yeah. and Selena Gomez. Selena Gomez is really good. It, it was genius to put um, a, a three people together and one of them is Selena Gomez and the other two are the old men. It's really genius. Yeah, have to check it out. Our, our most recent fun thing was, um, shoot. I forget what it's called. Oh, I'm really determined to find this animated thing for you guys. Oh. <laughs> um, Deadlock, uh, L O C H. Oh, Deadlock, L O C H, yes. Um, it's uh, set in Tasmania, it. It which looks is really the good. Australian yeah. version of Alaska. Yeah. An incredible amount of swearing yeah. <laughs> and a lot of uh, crude sexual terms, but it's it's almost all um, women, lesbians. And that isn't a part of the, the conceit kind of, I guess it kind of is. But anyway, just brilliant, super funny. Um, I have to look up a lot of Tasmanian slang, though, which is, is, is interesting. Yeah, that, that doesn't sound like an obstacle so much, <laughs> strangely. <laughs> one of the things about it, I, I recommend it to you, Jerry, earlier, and I was wondering afterwards, it's one of the, it, it actually, it takes a long time to resolve the mystery. Um, and they, they keep getting really close and you go, okay, this must be the resolution of the mystery because everything fits. And then right. it's like, no, nope, that didn't fit. Oh man. Actually, one or two more pieces. And it's like, okay, guys, come on. Yeah. You know, um, but, but the end like totally paid off. So unlike some, some series where it's like severance was like that, even more so where mm -hmm. the, the end was like worth anything that you had to do to get to the end. Oh, really? And the, it, the whole it's, series it's not good. over, is it? Severance? I think uh, they're I coming back. I'm, I'm pretty sure they're coming back. Yeah, no, it was great. It's great. The, huh. the end episode was just mind blowing. I haven't watched because I sort of saw the premise. And I'm like, well, okay. It's, it's one of those things, and and then even when you're watching it, it feels like it, like you. It's kind of like guilty watching it. It's like mm, this is kind of creepy. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the feeling. It was a little bit like a Black Mirror. Kind of, yeah. kind of sense, and I, I stopped Black Mirror when it got too close to reality. Yeah, I was like, "Oh, I can see that happening." Oh, I don't want that future. <laughs> A little too realistic. Um, huh. So we haven't resolved the portrait versus uh, landscape problem, have we? <laughs> Although we did make a nice loop around it. it, it it's, it's definitely one of those that is not, it's not to be resolved. It's only to, you know, I mean. What's interesting about like 360, like let's, let's pretend that a severance was done in 360. The problem with 360 in doing There's drama. There's a scary concept, right, Pete? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the problem with it is that the filmmaker needs you to see certain things for you to catch what's going on in the plot. Um, and if you're not oriented in a particular direction and you just miss action that happened over here that wasn't audio, uh, you're just not on board with what's been happening with the, with the plot. I don't game enough to know whether that's like something where there's a means. I mean, I would think that there could be some way where you 
it's it's an understood aspect of the immersive experience that mm -hmm. your attention can be drawn to something by like a sound yeah. and and or I, I would even literally I, having the axis rotate or something yeah i think i think it would be fine to to grab the camera and and point it right. in a direction yeah and and actually even if there might there will end up being tropes where it's like okay the director pointed me here and then i know that i have to look back there you know it's the equivalent of panning and you know panning and right. jump cuts or whatever yeah. it's, it's the vocabulary yeah. of 360. yeah hmm I think we'll resolve all that. And I think the other thing is you end up with multiple cuts, right? You get the, you know, this, you, you, people get to kind of redirect it. Um, and hopefully so you still pause and rewind. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I actually, as, as we were talking about that, I was really thinking like, this is where sound and ultimately other senses depending on how sophisticated immersive yeah. experiences get come into play where like if there's something you're supposed to notice that's outside where you're looking there's a there's a sound there's a scent there's a presence that makes you turn and that's yeah. part of the director's work yeah. hmm. cool well, I am failing to share this amazing animation with you, but I'll find it somewhere. Do you think it was Netflix? Mm. I thought it was Netflix. It might have been. It, it was a. It was a series. It was an anthology series of animations that. Um. It could have been. Actually, I should look and see. There's a, there's a new comedy sci-fi series that's about this guy who gets stationed on mars um uh and is trying to maintain his relationship with his girlfriend who's back on earth and it's not going so well um <laughs> and uh but you know it's it's a little bit on the order did you ever see there was um there was a, a series about five years ago called um, American alien something that was like a city where just walking around like you know there, there was one human looking guy his roommate was sort of an octopod of some kind and there there were other you just walked around and it's just like there were there Superman, were American alien um, Is that it? there were alien races anyway I got a bunch of links to send, send you guys I don't know if we're uh, we're hard stopping here, but um, we often go past. But uh, probably a good time to wander back um, to real life. M Michael, uh, you're not thinking of Love, Death, and Robots, are you? No. Um, trying to remember what this is the problem with with networks. If you um, only had a brain. I mean, services. Yeah. Uh, like searching for them broadly is not always easy. Maybe if I go to my the Just Watch app is often and IMDb are often the yep. ways to cut across. And it, it, it's getting a little worse. First, there's too many offers, too many over-the-top offers. Second some things leave one property so netflix lo loses and gains a bunch of yeah. different media so what you thought you saw on netflix is no longer available oops um i just watched um um tom hanks uh, charlie wilson's war mm -hmm. uh, which i thought i had seen but seemed all new when i watched it it was really really good um it was it was a nice snapshot of that point in time and, and the politics of it and everything else. Um, and now it, it, apparently uh, August 31 is its last day on Netflix. So hurry up if you want to see it. Um, by the way, I'll share. Are you guys familiar with um, with uh, Anna Lily Amirpour and the movie um, A Girl Walks Home in the Dark? Um, 
Mm -hmm. Or a girl, no, sorry, A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. No. Nope. Um, really, really good film, um, about six years old. Uh, but <laughs> my means of discovery there <laughs> was the fact that she Airbnb'd our apartment. Whoa. And <laughs> uh, That's so cool. discovered her work, discovered, like, I was like, I watched it and was sharing it with Ivy and Ivy said to her sister, you know, Oh, have you ever seen this movie? And my sister and her sister says, Oh, that's one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, and, uh, <laughs> so that, that, you know, an underrated discovery mechanism. And, uh, I'll go on to say that the last Airbnb guest we had is, uh, was Glenn, um, Lushler, I think his name is, who is in Barry and Billions. Um, you'd, you'd recognize him. Cool. Um, and <laughs> so it's just a... You should write a screenplay about your Airbnb guests and create a, create a plot. Like, You know, I, I actually did have mm. an idea for a plot. Many, many years ago, I was subletting a fascinating apartment for a year from somebody who was away and and the idea of doing a story where a tenant you know a subletting tenant is discovering who somebody is and solving some kind of mystery without any interaction without any foreknowledge of what they were walking into they're just in a place and the mysteries of the place reveal a greater mystery as they discover stuff and also you know have the moral tug of war with themselves of what they can and should do to discover more um, now you have to install a dimensional portal in your airbnb flat <laughs> right and and yeah, and, and it becomes a reality show. It becomes yeah. Big Brother, and people just have exactly. to sign a waiver when they come in. Right, that's it. You're done. Okay. Yeah. Except, except uh, in 360 video. Yeah. So, circling us back around to portrait versus landscape. Excellent. Shall we wrap the call? Sounds good. Sure. <laughs> I'll send you guys some links. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. It's okay. fun. Appreciate yeah. it. Bye. Bye.